Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Chen. I'm one of the program managers uh, for Azure Storage, and what we're here to talk about today is delivering solutions um, with Azure Cloud Storage. Um, so again, thank you very much for coming out, particularly at the uh, last time slot on a Friday afternoon, so I'll try to make this worth your while. Quick question, uh, quick poll. How many of you are application developers? Okay, got it. And how many of you are IT pros, storage administrators, infrastructure administrators? Okay, great. So everybody, please, you know, stay in your place. There's something in this talk um, for both of you, so, uh, so hopefully we'll keep it interesting. What we'll cover today is an introduction to Azure storage overall, and then we'll drill and spend most of our time on the object blob storage. Uh, and we'll talk about, about a bunch of different things in terms of how it works, design considerations, uh, some of the technology, and also solutions that have been built. Uh, on Azure Storage and some of the integration that we have with very well-known third-party ISVs, um, particularly to meet existing workflow uh, requirements. Um, to kind of mix it up along the way, we'll also have some uh, customer, customer testimonials, some case studies where we talk about some of the integrations that partners have done, uh, as well as some demos. So we'll definitely uh, try to make it worth your, uh, worth your time on a Friday afternoon. The first thing uh, I want to kind of lay in is, you know, we think about storage um, and, you know, kind of regardless of your discipline, some of the challenges that you may be facing uh, or trying to address with storage, right? Number one is scalability limits. And I like to explain cloud storage is not just taking what you could do on-prem and moving into the cloud, sort of same stuff, different, uh, different place, but being able to do things differently or in a new way with cloud, particularly as it relates to scalability and agility, right? So when you purchase storage today, think about how much of a forecasting, planning, or operational exercise that can sometimes be. Trying to figure out how much data growth your organization has, uh, maybe across different silos or tiers, where you're going to have to put it, the different SLAs and needs. Uh, what's your capex, what's your budgeting cycle, how long does it take to deploy storage? So a lot of those operational considerations and activities, don't get me wrong, are very, are very important and critical part of your job, but it introduces risk and its burden that cloud storage can readily address in terms of its ability to scale, to deploy seamlessly across regions and to deploy across many different models. And we'll get into that. Uh, another one is risk management. Um, and hopefully, as you heard in the keynote speech yesterday, one of, the, one of the core foundations of Azure is that we're heavily invested in making it a trusted and robust platform, right? The first law of storage is don't lose this data, don't corrupt the data, don't put the data at risk. And so that's something that consumes a lot of time and effort in managing a storage estate, deciding what storage technologies to use and how you think about your storage. And that's something that we also address with Azure Storage. There's the cost of storage, right? So just uh, for one, the capital expenditure and the cost of storage, but as I mentioned about scalability and planning, some of the other issues that go with managing a storage infrastructure. Uh, if you bought too much, you have underutilized capacity. If you bought too little, you're constraining your business until you can deploy more, and sometimes that's a bit of a fire drill. If you need to expand into a new region where you have no presence, even putting that first terabyte of data in place in another area can suddenly become very challenging, costly, uh, or demanding. Uh, there's the cost of maintenance, keeping the personnel lights on, uh, maintaining your data center, or maintaining your colo, or maintaining the relationships with your provider. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of it all, when the technology turns over, there's the, uh, there's the wonderful chore of migration. How do I move the data from my current solution to my next generation solution so that I can keep data alive? Particularly if you have a very, very long retention period, uh, that can be something that's also very burdensome. And so a lot of these activities can conspire to Having you spend a lot of time on overhead or maintenance related to maintaining your storage, but not enough to thinking about how you can help your business grow or use storage for what it's meant to, right? Enabling your data, enabling your application, not becoming something that requires an excessive amount of care and feeding investment just sort of unto itself. And so Azure Storage, from a principal standpoint, is, is built on some pillars that try to address that. Number one is scalability, and it's, it's practically limitless, so you can grow very, very large, right? How, how quickly can you get a petabyte of storage and bring it online anywhere in the world? But it's not just for petabyte scale needs. So if you have something very small, heck, if your existing capacity is constrained, even getting that next terabyte of data can be very challenging, and that's easily and seamlessly doable with Azure. Uh, trust. So it's a number of different ways. It's the durability model that we have, it's the availability, how we protect the data, how we verify the integrity of the data, but also the certifications and the reach that Jason mentioned in the keynote yesterday that help us give you confidence that we meet compliance requirements, certification, and other things that may be required for specific environments or regulatory requirements in the businesses that you do. 
Uh, and then the economics of cloud, right? Being able to pay as you go, seamlessly scale up, but also scale back, right? Not having idling, depreciating assets that are underutilized. So DR is a great example, right? If you're not using the server assets and they're on standby, cloud is one of those models where you can keep your data very safely uh, in another location, do that very easily, and also bring up resources only as you require and only pay for what you consume. And so this is all really meant to give you that agility that cloud can deliver, um, give you cost savings, uh, enable to, and enable you easily to scale or, or get the type of resources that you need to grow your business and to innovate. So what exactly is Azure Storage? It is a key foundation of pretty much any Azure service. So uh, uh, hopefully you, you got to take in a number of the sessions here. Uh, fundamentally, in some way or another, they all run or are built on or depend on Azure Storage, and Azure Storage, that infrastructure, uh, is the underpinning. And you may have actually seen elements of Azure Storage in some of the other demos, like, uh, like the block blobs or the object storage. Also, a lot of Microsoft's other cloud services uh, and course, customer-facing services are also built on and run on Azure. So some of the notable examples, Office 365, uh, OneDrive, Xbox Live, Skype, also all leverage uh, Azure storage in some fashion. What are the key attributes? So hyperscale. Today we host over 120 trillion objects uh, in Azure storage, and we're doing on average over 20 <clears throat> million transactions per second. Uh, and then a little bit more in terms of our footprint, in the time that we're gonna have this talk, we will onboard a net new six billion objects into the platform and flow, the ingress-egress traffic during that time will be on the order of about two and a half petabytes. If you look at, um, if you look over the course of a year, right, we are doing on the order of hundreds of trillions of transactions and flowing and trafficking multiple dozens of petabytes, I mean, sorry, exabytes into and out of the platform in that time. So a mind-boggling scale that, again, we're making available uh, to any user in any increment as small as, you know, a few megabytes all the way up to hundreds of petabytes. No, our, our, uh, our geographical footprint and our data center investment is, is continuing to grow. So we are continually building out greater and greater amounts of capacity. Um, so if you saw the video uh, that was at the keynote, right, I've been to one of those data centers, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a hardware geek, so it's really cool. We are stamping out very large numbers of those and constantly growing um, the infrastructural capacity. Now that isn't to say that we're not investing in storage efficiency. So for example, things like when bigger hard drives come out, we get better density and better efficiency, but at the same time, we are growing physical footprint. Uh, the other thing is if you, um, you know, if you play back the tapes through other sessions, any time that, uh, that slide that comes at this says how many regions we have is up, that thing changes practically with every event. We have to like constantly update that chart to make sure that it's, uh, that it's in place. So there's the one, you know, not, not to knock on competitors, I think it said, you know, we're, we have as many regions as our other two competitors combined and then some. Um, the footnote to that is our growth year on year was more than the regional footprint of our next competitor. So, I mean, the, the amount of scale, and that's a core tenant of Azure, right? That's one of the areas we've chosen to strategically invest because you don't wanna have to spend a lot of time thinking about or feeling constrained about where you wanna be, right? If your business grows, if you have an international expansion, right, you want a cloud provider that is there and that can deploy data there you know, relatively quickly, right, versus wondering, okay, are they going to be where I need them to be? And so that was a very, very conscious choice that we've made in Azure strategically. Um, and we're continuing beyond that to invest in the growth of the platform, again, regional reach, um, certifications, overall capacity, but we're onboarding um, <clears throat> something like 120,000 new subscriptions uh, every month, and our growth rate is continuing to accelerate. So durable, as again, I mentioned, um, and we'll get into more detail on this, but the rule is you never lose your data. So we have multiple copies, and we're a very, very durable platform. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, maybe confusion or mystery around how durable cloud storage is. Is it reliable? Um, having come from an enterprise storage background, I can tell you it's, it's very robust, very secure. We'll talk about some of the things that we do um, that sound familiar probably to those of you who are familiar with like enterprise SAN arrays in terms of how we protect the data. Security, uh, so kind of a table stakes thing, but we, we offer all of the, the core capabilities, um, encryption at rest, client side encryption, um, and uh, integrated with our key vault services. <clears throat> Uh, additionally, there is the element of our data center security, right? So kind of little things like um, if we have a drive failure, we don't return that to the vendor, right? So the physical bits are never put at risk. Um, 
it goes into basically a very large chipper, gets shredded, and is never seen again, right? So uh, physical security, both in terms of, you know, physical asset, excuse me, access to the data center, uh, and how we manage the hardware as well. Uh, so highly available, uh, we have a very highly scalable distributed file system automatically load balancing. So for example, if we see that one of your objects is getting hit with a lot more requests, we automatically bring additional compute power, uh, dynamically distribute and load balance across more servers uh, to give you a better experience and to give you more performance. <clears throat> also highly fault tolerant. Uh, so again, depending on the size of your storage, you're probably, you know, of course everything is at least, uh, you know, two-way two, two -way redundant. You can survive a component failure. We can, of course, survive any type of component failure, but beyond that, because of our scale, also survive things like rack level events um, or with geo-replication, even a complete data center outage. Uh, open, so a key premise, and hopefully, again, you saw this theme, uh, resonate throughout the entire event, right? We wanted to make it, no matter what platform you're on, no matter what the target is of your application, no matter what you're doing with your data, for Azure Storage to be open, accessible, uh, and usable by anyone. And so we have a very rich set of client libraries across all major <coughs> development platforms, not just Microsoft, also including Linux and, you know, Python, Node.js, all of the major environments, uh, and, and a rich set of tools to help you develop against Azure Storage. And finally, hybrid, and this is really important because I think hybrid is a, is a very broadly used term. Um, so we have a number of different forms of hybrid, but we are the only cloud provider that says, look, you have a set of capabilities that we've built into Azure and a set of IP in terms of how all that works, and now you've made an investment in developing your applications, your capabilities against Azure storage. So with the Azure Pack for Windows servers and with Azure Stack, you'll be able to take that experience and bring it back on premises and maintain all of the investments that you've had, right? So a seamless experience both in a public hyperscale cloud all the way down to a private deployment, right? Allowing you to do the same thing in different locations if that's your choice, right? Our, our end vision or goal is not that all workloads move, you know, one time forever more and all or nothing into the public cloud. I think in all of your environments, you will have applications that will probably stay on premises for a variety of reasons and some that will go into the public cloud. And we want to, to have, to, we want to recognize that hybrid is a, is a persistent state that is something that you're going to need based on your requirements, um, not a winner takes all proposition. Another part of it, uh, beyond being open and also beyond our own first party offerings, uh, is we offer a number of technologies, so things like Store Simple, ASR, Azure Backup, but we also work very extensively with third party ISVs to integrate Azure Storage into their solutions. So if you have investments um, with certain enterprise applications or solutions in your environment, we wanted to make it easy to connect Azure Storage to those versus having to replatform everything just to leverage some of the benefits that we're describing. So to get a little bit more into what specifically are the Azure storage services, um, so we have kind of the IaaS, so if you're the IT pro, these are the ones that may be a bit more familiar to you. Um, we have two main constructs, which is disks and files. So disks are exactly what uh, they sound like. It's a, meant to be kind of a random access disk-like device. It serves as the persistent and durable storage that uh, underpins our VM. So if you have a VM disk, uh, or if you use our premium storage, uh, then that's basically the disk type of storage. We actually found that in some cases, customers want to use that type of random access pattern outside of just VM access, uh, and so we've also made it uh, accessible as, a, as, an, as an endpoint through APIs. Uh, and then we also offer a managed service SMB share, which is Azure Files, uh, and so it's effectively sort of your easy, magical, you know, NAS in the cloud, if you will, right? It's a central repository where you can stand up a cloud share, provision it easily from the portal, and then have an SMB mount point so that you can access that data in a shared fashion, either from within Azure by Azure VMs, uh, or also <coughs> over, a, over an internet connection. And the other thing is, beyond SMB access, you also do have programmatic access to the same set of data through an API, uh, through a REST API. So if you have a legacy application that needs to access it through the files protocol, you can connect through SMB. But if you're developing an application uh, that can leverage the API, you can access and use the same data set both ways. So kind of a unique capability that we have there. For the platform as a service, we have, uh, we have a couple offerings. One is what we call the blob store, which is effectively an object store, and that's our very, very large scale uh, repository. That's the one where you can put, you know, hundreds of petabytes, where you have trillions of objects. Very large scale, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the architecture and capability there. And within that, we have multiple offerings. So different durability, availability options, um, as well as tiering, depending on your cost transaction model and kind of what it is you need your data for. We also offer tables. 
uh, which is our NoSQL key value store that's used for, you know, structured and semi-structured data, as well as queues, which is our very reliable intra or inter uh, process messaging system so that you can break up your workflows or coordinate different, uh, different processes. A key thing is that these are all fundamentally built on the same, you know, unified code base and same distributed file system. So a lot of the principles that I talked about, um, some of the durability models and, and how we protect data, um, and the fact that, you know, when we light up a new region, pretty much all of these services are available in that region are from the fact that we have a leveraged code base. So in a way, these different endpoints are personas or offering that we, that we make based on a, on a common set of technology. Um, and so we get a lot of the same benefits by investing uh, in a foundation, and then that flows through to all of the different features. And it's also a fairly consistent experience, so to the extent possible, um, where it's not something that's differentiated based on the nature of the product, the API sets and the, and the way that you interact with the different storage types is also as common as feasible. So moving on to durability, we have three models. The first one is LRS is which what we call locally redundant storage. And in its own right, uh, it is very durable and resilient. So we have three copies. Um, one thing that's very important and is kind of a finer point, I think if you come from a non-prem storage background, this might not be something you think about, but if you're a developer, if you work with object cloud storage, it's important to note that one key attribute of Azure storage is that it is always strongly consistent. So we will not act the right on any type of a transaction until all copies are updated, right? So in some cases, uh, some vendors are selectively strongly consistent for some types of transactions. It will be that they won't act until everything is updated. In some cases, you may get back old data on a readback. So that's, that's something kind of uh, important to consider. We won't act until we have your data safely uh, committed to all three replicas, and so what that means is you can survive disk level failures, um, and you can survive you know, a server node or, or a storage node failure, um, but you can also survive a rack level failure. They're distributed at least so that the data is not resident in the same rack, right? So again, if you're actually operating a small scale, that can be really hard to do if you only have like a single uh, scale up type array or something to sort of physically place or shard the data in that fashion. <clears throat> Uh, so adding onto that, we have geo-redundant storage. And what that does is it adds an asynchronous replica in another geo-region. And, and for the most part, geo-regions are like 100, hundreds of miles apart. So the intent is it's outside of a natural disaster zone. Um, so for any of you who may or may not be from the West Coast, um, I am where this, the idea is like when the big one hopefully doesn't hit, but if it does um, and that data center is offline, uh, there's a data center that's outside of that disaster zone that will have your data and, and, and still be available. Um, it is an asynchronous um, replica. You can, pull the, uh, you can pull the transit time. Uh, and then the last offering is RAGRS. The little RA we add to that means read access. And so what that does is it allows you to have read access on the secondary copy that can give you a little bit more you know, scalability in terms of accessing the data uh, or improve the HA model. <clears throat> Uh, so again, beyond the strong consistency, which is a very, very fundamental tenant, uh, there's a couple other things. So you're probably familiar, um, nobody wants to see silent data corruption, bit rot, or, or, or lose their data. So all of the end-to-end the -end checking that's become fairly pervasive in its table stakes is very much a part of Azure, right? We, we do checksums uh, on a write to ensure that there's no silent data corruption as the, as the uh, data is committed. We always have an ongoing scrub process um, to look for any bit rot or any silent data corruption, uh, and we'll reconstruct or recreate the data and, and, and deprecate bad blocks as necessary. So the data is always, uh, is always secure and is always intact as you, as you wrote it. So now we'll dive a little bit more into, the, um, into what exactly our blob object service is. So what is it? It is, uh, for those who are familiar with the term, it is fundamentally uh, an object store. It's, uh, it's primary and best, although not only use case, um, is to store massive quantities of data and to primarily serve and store unstructured data. Um, so that can be like uh, just any type of user files, uh, video files, music files, uh, media, and things of the like. Uh, so some applications, uh, certainly application and web scale data, right? And, and that sort of also bleeds into like IoT uh, data ingestion use cases or things like, you know, mobile devices. If you have something that's syncing and collecting data from, you know, massive numbers of mobile devices or endpoints, blobs are a really great way to ingest that data uh, and, and rapidly scale up as your user base grow and the, and the estate of data grows. It just seamlessly expands along with it and, and retain that data in a very, very cost-effective matter. 
Um, so IoT is a great use case, and then also one that we see a lot is genomics, right? Just gene sequencing data, all of that is, it consumes a very large amount of storage uh, and the need to process it, <coughs> and so a very good use case. Uh, and then a third one for the IT pros uh, that we're seeing a lot is being used as a backup target or an archive target, right? So that's one of those cases where you have data that you want to ingest and store. Uh, and in the case of some archives, it could be what we colloquially call kind of the write once, read maybe use case. You have a very large amount of data. It could very much be aged, right? It's, it's old. You don't actually know if, if somebody may even use it again, um, but if they do, you definitely have to be able to get it back, and you have to store it for a very long time. And in some cases, that can be lower value data, um, like consumer emails or email attachments, right? And, and nobody knows if somebody will dredge that up. Uh, or on the other end, it can be like financial data or compliance data, things that you have to retain and also be able to discover as necessary, right? So if you need a cost-effective repository, you don't want that type of data sitting on, you know, your primary SAN or if your space constrained, uh, even lower cost on-prem archive solutions can become uh, can become costly to maintain over time. Object storage is, is really great for that. Um, or even as a backup target, right? So through purpose-built backup gateways that support cloud tiering, uh, or we have ISVs that even support direct backup to cloud, you can use the object storage as a very cost-effective and easy target, and also at the same time then meet the requirement and best practice of having a copy of your data off-site, not in your on-prem location. So key features. You store petabytes of data, but again, it's not just for storing petabytes of data. You can store a few megs all the way up to hundreds of petabytes, and we'll go through that in the demo. Uh, durability options, <clears throat> highly available. So we are SLA backed. Um, for, uh, for standard storage, for LRS, uh, it is a three nines SLA. Um, and for our AGRS, we offer four nines for reads. Now, that being said, our actual SLA exceeds that, but this SLA is actually something that we provide in writing, um, and there are credits and, and compensation if we don't meet the SLA. Strongly consistent. <clears throat> uh, and the ability, again, to dynamically scale up bandwidth and, and TPS, right? So it is auto load balancing if we see a very high amount of traffic. Um, if a blob is being accessed many times, then we can do split partition, we can load balance, and we can, we can bring more power uh, to serve that object so that, uh, so that your user experience does not degrade. So why is it a good thing? The limitless scale, you just worry about your application, ingesting as much data as possible. You don't have to worry about hitting boundaries on growth or saying, okay, well, my data is scal scaling up. I need to contact procurement, or I need to get operations, I need to provision and spin up more storage, right? You can just keep going and going and going. It's globally accessible, so if you need to place your, your data uh, and your storage in another region to either be close to your customers, to be close to where it's accessed, or being close to where it's ingested, um, or you're working with other groups, you can place it in any of our 38 regions. Again, that's why we've invested in that footprint that you can leverage so that you don't have to open up data centers all over the planet um, where that's not your core competency, as well as the cost efficiency. Um, and some of the scenarios that we kind of already mentioned. Um, but I'll take a break. You're probably a little tired of hearing from me at this point. So we actually have uh, a customer um, who has leveraged object storage for their web services, and uh, we'll go over a video testimonial from them. My name is Brandon Linton. I'm a solution architect on CarMax.com, the online systems platform team. And today I'd just love to share with you a couple examples of how we've leveraged Microsoft Azure, and specifically cloud uh, storage, to improve the availability and capability of our systems, hopefully give you a few ideas of how you can improve your own, maybe get called a little bit less. Uh, so first, I'd like to jump over to CarMax.com. So this is our homepage. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with CarMax, we're the nation's largest used car retailer. We've got over 160 stores nationwide, but right now we're going through a digital transformation where um, really everything's changing for us and we're, we're moving into more of an e-commerce space. Um, so there's a ton to do on the site. We recently uh, completely redesigned and replatformed the site, but I'm going to jump right into search listings and find a car. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice as these load is that we've got a ton of real estate dedicated to uh, vehicle images, and we've spent a lot of time and money on this because we know customers love these images. Um, we know that when the vehicle doesn't have them for whatever reason, the cars just sell uh, much uh, less quickly. And so it's really important to us uh, to make that uh, really good and really prominent. You can see here there's an image slider utility where I can engage with them before I jump in. But of course, I'll dive deeper into the car itself. And on this page, uh, again, there's a lot to do. 
Um, one of the most exciting things is that you can hold the car for free, which is great. Um, but again, really, first and foremost are uh, all these vehicle images and the ways that you can engage with them. And so I've actually pulled up uh, one of these pictures in a separate tab just to show you that um, this is actually coming from a separate website altogether, img2.carmax.com. And up here is actually the width.jpg. So I can make this any arbitrary number, and it's going to scale to that. And the really nice thing about that is uh, we're actually a uh, fully responsive site. So if I pull this in, get a little lost. Um, this is fully responsive, so it's going to um, scale to match the user's resolution. And so having dynamic resizing really helps us deliver the right image to the right device uh, at the right time. But it wasn't always this good. So about three years ago, we weren't in the cloud at all. Um, and so I'm going to discuss a little bit about our original images architecture. So the uh, basic process was at the store, store associate would take pictures all around the vehicle, would use a, a custom desktop uploading application to submit those to uh, our team's suite of image services. And that would do a couple of things. It uh, would upload to this image sand, so this is really about static resizing. We'd get um, six different sizes of the images and put them there. And then we'd also log all of those URLs because they weren't really guessable, they weren't any convention, um, so that applications could pull from that database, serve them up, and then there was just a very simple static file handling IS site that sat in front of that. But that had three really big challenges. The first was capacity. So that image sand was a fixed size and we were about to hit it right about the same time we wanted uh, bigger, better, higher quality photos. Uh, so that was painful, so we frantically tried to compress those images to make sure you know, we didn't slam into the wall. Um, we tried to spin up another uh, fixed size sand, but that was taking a lot of time, copies were taking hours, and we also tried to spin up a, uh, another sand, another data center, and copy that over, but of course that was taking days. So none of these were really working for us, and we didn't have the capacity to pull off dynamic resizing at this point. It's a very CPU intensive operation. Uh, so we looked around and really uh, Microsoft Azure and Azure Storage were the answer to all of those challenges. Uh, everything pretty much remains the same here except we upload the original image uh, straight to blob storage. And so this solves our capacity problem because as Vamshi mentioned, it's basically unlimited scale. So I think we've tripled the size of our original image sand and we, we didn't even know, I had to look that up before this talk. Um, to get high availability, well, we just enabled uh, read access geo-redundant storage. So within a couple of minutes, those images replicate right across to the east region from west. Those are in sync within a couple of minutes. And it's really powerful because we know we can always serve up images from either data center. And then to handle the dynamic resizing for all these different devices, uh, all that traffic comes through Azure Traffic Manager. And that gives us the ability to route intelligently and also um, shift all the traffic to one region if there's some sort of a problem. Um, so that's really powerful to deliver the right image to the right device. Um, and then when we went to that uh, site redesign replatforming project that I mentioned, uh, it just made total sense to move our entire web tier into Azure and get a lot of the same benefits. So we're active active for CarMax.com. We're in two uh, regions, east and west US. Uh, we actually, we didn't do kind of a traditional lift and shift. We uh, actually targeted uh, all these platforms as service offerings. So uh, cloud services, SQL Azure, uh, and Azure Redis caching. Uh, caching is one of my favorite because, you know, as a web team, we talk forever about having a distributed uh, out-of-process cache, and I don't know if uh, many of you have got a lot of problems uh, provisioning on-prem and just the time that it takes to get all that spun up. Who can run these things operationally? But that was certainly uh, our problem, and in less time than it took me to explain that problem to you, we just provisioned it in Azure. We went to the portal, we clicked Add New, um, we used resource templates, and it was a huge win for our performance and availability. Um, but we didn't rewrite everything, so the on-prem services that we have still that we reach back over to, uh, we achieved that through application request routing, which is a reverse proxy technology, as well as uh, express route, excuse me, express route, which is in the works. Uh, so what's next for vehicle images? So uh, because of that limitless capacity we talked about, 360-degree uh, photos, videos, these are all things that um, are options that are available to us now, so we're going to invest in that. We're also leveraging the image met metadata that comes from the uh, cameras at the store to start to be able to group photos by exterior and interior images, which is really powerful. And then finally, we have a, uh, an owner's application. Uh, this is uh, newly launched that allows uh, past purchasers to 
um, register their vehicles that they've purchased them and then uh, kind of own the entire ownership experience. Um, it would be great to offer the high quality pictures that we took of those cars early on. Uh, and so um, we're gonna look at moving those into cool storage, so uh, leverage even more cost efficiency. And finally, uh, for teams, you know, all this technology has uh, been a huge cultural shift for us at CarMax. Um, we've got these cross-functional product teams, uh, product owners, um, lead engineers, lead user experience designers, and um, we, we just wanna continue to leverage those great benefits to peel apart some of those bigger services that you saw so that they can have their own uh, highly available microservices and innovate quickly on those. Uh, finally, if you're ever in the Richmond, Virginia area, um, this picture in the background is our uh, new digital transformation space, and uh, we'd love to have you come by, talk about architecture, come visit us sometime. So, thank you. So, let's uh, get into maybe some more specifics about working with blob storage. Just some, uh, just a primer on some topics, right? So, let's say you're, you're a customer. Um, you'll uh, have one or more subscriptions, and so subscription is sort of one layer. It can actually be a different billing relationship, and I'll show you that when I show the demo. So example, uh, I have a Paygo um, subscription, which is, as it sounds, I gave them my credit card, it's pay-as-you-go, and then I also have an MSDN, so depending on you know, your EAs or whatnot or what you have as a customer, uh, you can have multiple subscriptions. And within subscriptions is where you place uh, a storage account. So that is effectively like a logical uh, container where you'll then put, um, your different types of storage, and, and that can be uh, heterogeneous, where you have a mix of things like objects, tables, files, queues, as I described, um, or we also have the dedicated blob storage accounts, which is really just used for the object storage, and there you can tier from either hot blobs um, or cool blobs. We do also offer an additional layer of, of sort of a logical abstraction. You can think of it, so object stores by their nature are generally flat in nature, right? So they don't have a traditional hierarchy folder structure like, uh, like legacy file systems, but we do offer one sort of pseudo uh, level of directory, and that's a container. Um, and you don't have to have that, so you can just put everything in the account, or you can use a container, uh, and then within the container you put your blobs. Uh, and then every blob has an associated URI that is a function of the account um, as well as the Windows domain and then the containers uh, and then the blob name. And I'll talk a little bit about why containers can potentially be useful or some of the practices around that coming up. So as you saw there, the blob has a name. Um, and so the name is composed out of the account name. It's 324 characters, lowercase only. Uh, the optional container name, uh, which is 3 to 63 characters, and again, lowercase only, um, and then the blob name, which can be up to, you know, a thousand characters, so it can be quite long, um, and it is case sensitive. And so within that, using prefixes, um, you can actually create virtual directories within a blob namespace. So if you sort of have a file structure you want to have in mind, it is still possible to implement that, um, and I'll show that later. Another important thing is that the, um, the partition key is tied to the blob name. So depending on the performance requirements of how you're going to use your storage, um, you may want to choose your naming convention very carefully, right? Depending on, in some cases, it might be okay to, to sequentially name your blobs if it's something you're not really accessing frequently. Um, but if you have performance demands or these are files that you're going to be serving, um, you will want to have some form of randomization, if possible, at the front end of your name because we, that's what we use um, to partition and load balance, right? So if you have something that's, you know, um, my file one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, then, and, and all, everything by that use case is, is in sort of that same naming pattern, um, it makes, the, it makes the, the partitioning very difficult. So just sort of a best practice in terms of designing the naming convention. Types of blobs. So to be super specific, we actually have three different types of blobs. Um, one is what we call the block blob, and it's called a block blob because it's, uh, it's uploaded in block parts, and I'll explain that more uh, coming right up. This is the most common kind, against for the large storage, uh, documents, images, videos, so basically the unstructured data. We actually have a variant of this that's probably not commonly known. It's called the append blob. So it's meant for multi-writer scenarios. Um, so if you're streaming a lot of output, you don't want to worry about, you don't, or you don't need to worry about, you know, concurrency or leasing and locking. You're basically doing something. So it could be like a map R job where you're just streaming out a lot of data uh, or some sort of log file where you have a lot of writers who can just continually append. Um, we have the append blob. It's a little bit esoteric, but very useful for those use cases where that's the type of access pattern that they want. Uh, and then the page blob, which is actually the underlying technology, as I mentioned earlier, for our VM disk. So it's a sparse file. You interact with it uh, in 512-byte pages. So it effectively behaves like a disk. It's really designed then um, for random access patterns, um, whereas large objects are kind of meant to be, to be handled uh, in, in larger chunks. 
Uh, and again, you know, in all of these cases, uh, we have Azure services for things that are utilizing it beyond VM disks. Um, as you can see, they're like our event hub, uh, and also some of, our, some of our other services are based on page blobs instead. So in terms of the blob structure, uh, you have some standard properties. So one, it'll tell you what blob type you actually have, which of those three. Um, you will have an E tag and a last modified, so that can be used uh, for concurrency scenarios, which I'll go into later, right? But it has the last modified date, and then an, also an E tag that changes whenever the blob is updated. Uh, and then you have the content length and the MD5 checksum, which can be used to verify data integrity, right? So if you sent and landed it, um, that nothing changed along the way. Then you also have the capability for user-defined metadata, so you can add up to eight kilobytes of sort of key value user-defined pairs, and this can be very useful, so later I'll talk about the fact that you can sort of search on your blobs, and you can search the metadata. Um, so it's sort of a useful little sidecar construct um, that can have you put in data that can make it easier to index, organize, uh, search, or manage that, uh, that data, right? There are no partial updates as it indicates there, so you have to retrieve and then set it, you always have, you have to change it, um, but it can be very useful, and then the other thing, so this is, this is kind of back to the hint that containers are very useful, is that you can do metadata at the container level, right? So if you have a container that's a logical grouping of all the objects underneath it, then you can set container level metadata um, for, for organization. <clears throat> uh, and okay, so each blob in of itself can be up to five terabytes, and I'll explain how that's composed. Uh, and then of course you can have up to, you can have up to 500 terabytes of data in an account, and you can have, um, hundreds of accounts in a subscription, and then as many subscriptions as you like, so practically unlimited, but you do scale through those various constructs. So let me break for a moment here, and I'll show you a little bit of it um, through three different uh, experiences. So first we have here, um, so this is the dashboard for my Azure account, and you can see here, um, this is my personal account, but I do have a pay-as-you-go subscription. Um, boy, sorry, that's really small. Uh, and as well as uh, the Visual Studio um, account, which is where I do most of my, uh, at least my experimentation with Azure. Um, so to create a new storage account is really easy. I'll just go here and click New, say Storage, and then pick a storage account. And so from there, I can name it anything. So, hello, Chicago 2017. Um, you have the choice of the two deployment models, um, the resource manager, which is kind of the current current state, as well as the classic. Unless you have a specific reason for using classic, we generally recommend, recommend you use the newer model, the, the resource manager. Um, and here's where you can choose a general purpose, which is if you want a heterogeneous mix of storages, or if you want object uh, only, you can pick uh, blob storage, and I'll pick blob storage. What's important about blob storage is if you want to use the hot cool tiers, those are available in blob accounts, not general purpose accounts. Uh, you can pick the replication, so again, you have the choice between the LRS, the GRS, and the uh, RAGRS. I'll just pick LRS here. You can choose cool or hot, and what's really um, cool, sorry, no pun intended, is that you can change this attribute, view, right? So if you have an account of data that's been actively accessed, right, and you're using it frequently, and that data has aged out, and you said, all right, look, I don't need that anymore. I want to move it to the cool tier. You can go check this property, and then it'll demote it to cool. So, I mean, that's, that's something that you can't really do in place with your existing on-prem storage, right? You can, you, you can move it to a cooler tier of storage, but you can't just check a button and then have it, have it demoted or, or staged off. So that's some of the flexibility that we offer with the platform. Um, you can choose to enable or disable encryption. Again, that's just one click. Um, which subscription it's put under, and I'll just use one of the existing resource groups here. And then pick your location, right? So, um, Again, with a drop down, I can, I can put it in, uh, in my choice of, of regions around the world. So I'll go ahead and get that started. But uh, in the meantime, I'll just sort of show one that, uh, that I already created so that uh, we can go through this. So you can see here, this is, a, this is an RAGRS uh, account that I created earlier. Um, and what you see here are a couple things is that I have a primary, so the primary location is in the West US 2 data center, um, and the secondary is in the West Central US data center. So again, geo pairs regionally, regionally split by several hundreds of miles, um, and there you can see there's um, a primary service endpoint, which is, again, the primary, um, and then also because I have RAGRS, you have the access to the secondary endpoint. Uh, and in the, uh, <coughs> I'm in uh, cool storage in this case, um, and it shows the subscription and some of the ID and whatnot. I'll go to another blob here where I actually put some, uh, put some data. So you can see here I have a single container. Um, and in here uh, I placed a little 
little tiny file. So if you click on that, you can see the properties here, um, which is the URI for that particular blob. Uh, it'll indicate here that it is a block blob, the size. Um, here's the last modified and the E tag, uh, and then the content checksum, as well as the lease date. So I'll talk about leasing and locking earlier, but it, it indicates whether the blob is available or not. Now, uh, navigating through the portal is one experience. Um, then there's also things that you can do through Visual Studio through the code. So I'll demonstrate, you know, some of the client libraries um, and some things that are available. But another really great tool that's available through our SDK is the Azure Storage Explorer. So if you're kind of used to sort of a file browsing experience with this, um, the Azure Storage uh, Explorer is available for free downloads. So you can see here again is my uh, Visual Studio subscription. And within that I have the different uh, storage accounts. And here is my blob demo. And so here's that original demo container um, where, I had my, uh, where I had my hello world uh, little, little picture there. Now I can also do an upload, and I'm upload a folder here. So I'll just pick one off my drive here. So these are some photos I took from the, uh, the keynote yesterday. And you can see here that it's, uh, that it's just sort of updated through this, through this experience. And I go here, and uh, some sort of live and timely photos from, from yesterday's event. And if I go back here into the portal, Yeah, there it is. Then my objects have updated. And uh, so you're probably saying, hmm, I thought uh, objects didn't have folder structures. Um, and so what that is, was done is using a prefix, which I'll explain later. Sorry, is there a question? I will explain that later. So hold that question. I'll talk about tiering, and, uh, and I promise you before the end of the talk we'll get to that. Uh, and then, you know, the, the last one is here. So through Visual Studio, you can also download um, download the SDK and the client libraries, as well as some of the samples, and this is a very simple one that'll just sort of interact with the blob, so I'll launch that up here. It's connected to my account. Um, and so what that does is we'll just pull up a little, yes. Uh, it, everything is available on GitHub. Also, when you download the SDK, it will offer you some samples, some quick start samples, as well as tutorials that will walk you through. Um, this one is really easy to do. You just drop in your storage account name, uh, and then the key, and then it has examples for all of these patterns. But yes, everything is also available at Gib GitHub, and I'll provide links uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, so you can see here it created a container, uh, only if it didn't exist, and uploaded the block blob. So let me go back uh, here to my demo container. Oh, here we go. And here's my Hello Chicago container. And a nice shot of the lovely city here. Uh, and then it'll list the blobs in the container, and then it can clean itself up and delete the container. So a number of different experiences. You can do this through Visual Studio. You can do it through the Storage Explorer, sort of interacting almost as if you're, you're behaving with a share. Uh, on your machine, as well as, uh, as well as through the portal. And you can kind of see all the different attributes that I've talked about up until now. Okay, so uploading block blobs. If you're uploading a small blob, it's very straightforward. You can just do a put blob uh, command, which can upload a small blob up to 64 megabytes, and it's, a, it's there. It'll overwrite a blob in place if you use the same name. Now, if you have a larger blob that's uh, more than 64 megs, which you very well may, and let's say you have a large movie or a media file, right? Um, what happens then is we split that into chunks, and each of those chunks can be up to um, 100 megabytes, and then we have a limit on the number of chunks, and that's how we get to the five terabyte um, limit. 
uh, those block, uh, excuse me, those blocks can be uploaded in parallel or in any order. So what happens is the object is decomposed into the blocks, uh, and then the blocks are assigned a block ID. So you'll say, all right, well, I'm gonna do this put block, which is a block ID, and then the context of that block, and then to finally summarize or to, to sorry, commit the blob, then you will do a put block list, which then says, okay, out of all the lists of the different block IDs um, and the blocks, let's put them all up there. And again, you can do this in parallel for efficiency and whatnot. So this leads to some sort of interesting behaviors that are unique to how we implemented it. Number one is you can do within blob deduplication. So if you have a block that is duplicated or referenced many times um, within the final object, you can just do one put block, I mean, sorry, put blob, and then when you do the put block list, reference that single blob many times. So you only pay once for uploading that chunk, but you can use it many times um, within the object. So it, it lends itself to a form of storage efficiency um, and deduplication. The other thing is then it makes our block blobs mutable, right? So versus, okay, I need to update the blob, I'm gonna have to re-upload the whole thing. Well, I have a, if I have a really big blob that's kind of a drag, and if I only have a few sections of it that changed, what you can do is selectively upload those changed blocks, recommit the list, right? So you have a mix of the old, old blocks um, and the new ones, you recommit the new list, and you've effectively updated it partially in place. So, um, so some kind of unique things, but the mutability is, is an aspect that we offer that, uh, that's not common in, in object storage. Okay, so downloading copying blob, get blob is basically that. You, um, you download the blob and make it available. Um, you do have the checksum available to make sure that you didn't have any data corruption or data integrity issues on download. Um, we do support range reads, so if you only need a portion of it, for example, if you have a very, very large file again and you wanna jump to it, it could be a, could be a media file or something that like. Um, if you know your offset, you can start from there. Um, and then we have a copy blob. So there's two ways. This is one, you can do a full copy. You basically download it, um, re-upload it. Um, you will lose your snapshots along the way. I haven't explained snapshots yet, so just wait and I'll get to that. Um, but we also implemented um, an asynchronous copy blob API. So that does a couple things. Is if one, you're within a storage account, if you're copying a blob um, within your own storage account, it's actually very fast because what we'll do is just create a new pointer reference to the existing um, to the existing blob. So we'll just up update the reference and you're good to go. And so that copy is very fast. Um, however, then you can also do things like you can copy uh, across accounts, which takes longer. You can copy from other sources, so like websites um, or even other clouds. <clears throat> uh, and we give you a copy ID so that you can pull the status of your copy. Uh, listing and deleting blobs, so this is where containers matter. Uh, listing is a container level operation. You can get 5,000 um, at a time, um, and you can specify a filter. So this is where that virtual um, directory structure comes, and you can have a prefix, and you can say specifies with, and so that effectively allows you to create a virtual folder. That's what I did when I uploaded the, the uh, Chicago images, is it, is it put it up that way. Um, let's see, yeah, so you can traverse them as well in the same fashion. So delete blob. Um, one other sort of gift of using a container is you can delete a container. And so the reason that may be important is if you have a project where again, you have a number of different objects, say you have thousands of objects and you're done with that, rather than having to submit a thousand delete transactions and eliminate those blobs one by one, you can eliminate the entire container in a single transaction and wipe out all of the blobs underneath it. Now there's a way to prevent that with leasing if that's not what you wanna do, but it can be very good for transaction efficiency if you have a grouping that supports that and, and you want to be efficient in your transactions. Um, and so to simplify uh, working with all of these services, um, so certainly all of the documentation is available on all the different REST API calls, so you can go look that up. But if you don't want to deal with that, um, we offer a set of client libraries um, pretty much across all of the, all of the major platforms that, that, that implement this for you, right? So it'll automatically chunk the blobs, um, you know, handle the uploads, do a lot of the efficiencies. Um, and again, the source code is also available on GitHub, so if you want to do a custom implementation or integrate some of the technology or technique or the pattern into your application, you also have that available to you as well. So another capability um, is versioning, um, or it's basically snapshotting. You can snapshot um, a blob. So when you do so, you'll basically get a copy of that blob or a virtual copy um, of that object. It is tied to the parent, so again, if you delete the parent um, blob, you will lose all of the snapshots associated with it. Um, so it is a point-in-time read-only copy 
uh, of that blob. It'll have the same name as a blob with a timestamp appended to it. You can read, you can copy and restore it, um, or you can delete it. So a read is fairly straightforward. Um, if you want to effectively sort of clone um, a, a previous history version of that blob, you can do a copy out. So basically you copy the snapshot uh, into a net new blob of its own. If you want to restore a snapshot, so let's say, um, so a good use of this is, is again, if you're about to roll a new version of your application, you may want to snapshot the data before you do so. So if you have a bug or something and the version of the data is, is corrupted or messed up, you can roll back. If you want to effectively restore, you just do, again, a copy out to the current parent version uh, of the snapshot. Um, so snapshots are not copied within a copy blob operation or within a normal copy blob operation. Um, and when you delete the blob, it will delete all associated snapshots. And it will ask you, is this what you want to do? But, uh, but that is a consequence of deleting the snapshot. Next is concurrency. So we have basically two, two and a half forms of concurrency. Um, one is optimistic. So we do, uh, as I showed earlier, offer the timestamps. Um, as well as the e tag, right? So it shows, you know, modified or unmodified since, um, and the e tag, which is something's been modified. So um, if you want to use that, then you can do conditional checks, which is, has anybody touched this blob since the last time my process has touched it? Um, and if so, then I may need mod modify or update or do something with it. And if the e tags match or the, or the date time matches, um, then I know no one else has updated it since I last looked at it. So that's a way to implement a, uh, an optimistic concurrency as, you know, conditions with the timestamp or the e tag. There's pessimistic concurrency, um, so locking, which is what we call leases, um, and you can lease the blob um, <clears throat> for exclusive access to it. Um, you can do so with duration, right, and so the reason you might want to set a fixed duration is if your process dies or something, it'll release the lock on the blob rather than holding it. Um, or you can have an infinite direction, uh, sorry, duration, which means that won't happen. Now, that doesn't mean if your process crashes that that blob is locked up, you can still unlock it with the master storage account, um, but it just won't release by default. Um, and you can also have uh, a lease ID, so if you're sort of passing ownership of a blob through a complex workflow, we see this in like media, media workflows, um, you can do that as well. And you can also acquire a lease on a container. Um, so as I mentioned, if you delete a container, it deletes all of the underlying blobs. So what you can do is you can acquire a lease on a container so that when you update a blob, you make sure that no other process deletes that container out from under or above the blob that you're working on. And then I call it half. It's probably not really one, but you could also just do last writer wins, which isn't concurrency, but you know, is another way of, of implementing it. Just whoever's the last one to, to do it gets, gets what they want. Uh, and we have extensive doc documentation um, on this. <clears throat> so I'll shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about a partner that uh, we have. So uh, I wanted to pick a case study that's actually um, relevant to the audience at hand. So um, an institution that I unfortunately have not had the privilege of visiting, but I understand is an absolutely gorgeous uh, local institution is the Field Museum. Uh, and they're a customer of a partner that we work very closely with and it's done a lot of integration in, of their services and basically built a lot of it on our blob technology, um, which is Nisuni. Um, so how many have been to the Field Museum? Okay, so I guess it is, it's very popular. I'll definitely have to make it out there. Um, I've heard amazing things about it. Um, it's over 100 years old, right? And uh, apparently it's the fourth largest natural history museum uh, in the world. And so they have a twofold mission. Um, one is, you know, pre preserving genetic diversity and, and biodiversity, and then the other part of it is a large genetic sequencing um, project. And so you can imagine that both of those um, lead to data growth and data proliferation uh, requirements. So you sort of face a couple key challenges. Is one, they're trying to create a digital archive uh, of the museum's existing collection. So, you know, di high-res digital photos, videos, um, whatever, capturing those assets. Um, and the another one is they're doing a very large sequencing project. Uh, so 25,000, um, you know, gene sequence from thousands of species each year. So they, they've got rapid growth and a need to store and ingest all that. Um, some of the challenges I mentioned up front infrastructurally are something that they're very much uh, facing in terms of, you know, A, wanting to protect the data by moving it off-prem. Um, so, I guess I didn't know this, but the museum is actually in a floodplain, so their data center is within the museum, so, you know, that's something that you wouldn't want the data to be lost if anything happened to their operations. And also, the, the floor space is extremely valuable, right, because that, that museum's not going to get any larger, so if they needed to grow their footprint and put more servers, put more arrays in place, uh, that would have to come at the expense of show space. Um, and they also have a fairly, uh, a fairly small team, so that's, that's not uncommon these days, but to manage this sprawl and to manage this growth 
um, without being able to scale headcount uh, accordingly was sort of the challenge. Uh, and again, ensure data protection, make sure that none of these assets are lost um, through disaster natural, uh, uh, natural events or anything of the like. So Nasuni has built a file services on top of Azure Object. So what they, what they offer is effectively, um, it's a global file system. Their paradigm, what you'll see is a lot of hybrid file systems, you know, either cloud gateways or the sort, is that the master copy resides in the cloud. So that's where the golden copy lives and it's backed by durability. It enjoys the benefits of, you know, uh, reach, accessibility, and everything from being built on Azure, right? So that's where the golden copy is. And then on-premises access is through the paradigm that those are sort of edge cache appliances, which will put um, the desired data on-prem so that it's a very, very seamless uh, and performant experience for the on-prem users, but again, with that master data in the cloud. They built a continuously versioning um, file system with very, very powerful snapshotting capability uh, on all of the different attributes of Azure storage, as well as uh, collaboration works flow, so leasing, locking ownership and coordination among the multiple edge sites uh, to, enable, to enable, you know, everyone to basically see uh, the same copy of the data in its centralized location. And that's, that's handled by a NOC that is, again, built and operated within Azure, right? So they have um, a storage as a service built on this UniFS, built on, our, on Azure objects, running in Azure, then serving data through cache uh, appliances uh, in their client location. So, you know, the best of the both worlds is, again, Azure provides that scalability, geographical reach, and the geographic um, redundancy. Uh, with this, the Field uh, Museum was able to dramatically expand their footprint over the last 12 months, and they have plans over the next couple years to go to 150 uh, terabytes of footprint, right? The Nasuni uh, file service also, because it has the cache appliances, so a lot of people are saying, hey, if I'm accessing direct from cloud, there may be uh, bandwidth limitations or, or concerns over latency and retrieval, uh, and the edge cache appliance and their caching algorithm takes, uh, takes advantage of that. So apparently there was a point in time where this had been implemented, uh, and none of their users, aside from the IT staff, actually knew that, that their on-prem solution had been replaced. Um, and again, always management is key, so having a single pane of glass, having a seamless management console um, that enables them to continue to grow the estate without adding uh, overhead and complexity to that uh, was a requirement. Uh, and you can see here the ability to grow, and another key point, right, is, uh, you know, being, <clears throat> being a nonprofit institution, uh, they're dependent on grants, the cycle for funding is different, so it's not sort of a traditional CapEx uh, planned budgets uh, that a lot of, you know, sort of commercial enterprises may have, so the ability to grow capacity on demand um, without having to forecast or pre-plan it in advance because they're backed on cloud storage uh, is, another, is another key advantage. And then because they're using GRS, they have six, they have six copies across two different locations, uh, both of which are off-prem, so not at risk of any uh, natural events that might occur in the region. And so the, uh, the kind of picture that I really like is uh, this is what their first 10 terabytes look like, and uh, this is what the next petabyte of their data will look like. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's important that, you know, part of what we're doing to be open is, is wanting to make sure that we harmonize with the use cases. Again, native, ab, native object access through the API, developing, you know, a cloud-first uh, application against the storage is gonna work for many. Um, so please go ahead and do that, and we wanna offer the tools. But at the same time, if you're, if you're a storage administrator, maybe you need something that's a little more turnkey. So we work with partners like Nasuni and several others that do this, right? They, they basically are built on object storage or built on Azure cloud storage, um, but they can offer legacy protocol access, right? Unified file or block access. Um, it can be a global repository centralized in the cloud, um, but accessible anywhere, and that through, can be through edge caching or if you reverse that, you know, on-prem tiering into the cloud. Um, you know, many of them offer global file locking, so if you have collaboration workflows um, where you have, you know, teams or staff across multiple sites that need to be able to collaborate and work on that same central uh, golden copy of data, that's doable. Uh, and then, of course, you can also do DR migration and failover scenarios. Um, as well as making sure that you do that with security. So in the case of Nasuni, most of the, uh, many, of, many other partners, uh, the data is deduped, chunked, and encrypted so that it's secure and also space efficient as it goes over the wire and lands within Azure. Um, and so we have you know, a number of partners um, who offer var varying solutions in this space. So depending on ones that you may be working with or your requirements, um, if sort of doing something net new isn't, isn't uh, <clears throat> isn't an option or isn't as appealing, or you, you want your first foray through the cloud to be through a more familiar access experience, um, a lot of these hybrid and global data access uh, partners have very, very good solutions. Um, this material will be available, so, um, so definitely please feel free to take a look at it. Shifting gears a bit, I'm gonna talk about some storage design patterns. 
Um, so one is data movement, right? Getting data into Azure, and we have a couple tools for that. One is part of the uh, SDK. We offer a tool called AZ Copy. So again, in terms of some of the things that you would do to make your uploads uh, more efficient, you know, chunking it out, doing parallelization, retries, um, you know, keeping logs, um, AZ Copy does that. It sort of implements the, the technologies and the best practices that we have around moving the data. Um, so it's an efficient way to copy and, and move uh, lots of files, um, and it supports our blob table and file storage. Um, and again, if you want to use that same technology, um, but you know, custom code that into your application, we have a data movement library that you can use um, to basically build that same type of data movement capability into your own applications. Uh, and then in terms of third parties, we also work with third party uh, vendors who have technology around accelerating uploads. So two well-known ones uh, are Aspera and Signet. They both use proprietary versions of like a UDP transport to further accelerate um, the upload of data beyond what you can do with TCP. Um, they both have um, sort of managed as a service offerings that are available in Azure and in the Azure marketplace um, as sort of, as well as client agents that basically, you know, create connection points uh, for their proprietary technology. Uh, and both of those are available uh, and work very well in Azure as well for accelerating file transfers if you need to get them up there quickly. Delegated authorization, right? So you can, you can give a user the, uh, the storage account name um, <clears throat> and the key and then they can do anything with it, but a lot of the times that's not what you're gonna want either in terms of uh, a user or process that's accessing your data. Um, so we have the concept of the shared access signature, the SAS token um, that you can you know, have direct access by client uh, apps, but you can basically sandbox them into, into certain you know, forms of privilege. Um, so uh, <clears throat> some of the things that you can do is you can grant rewrite access for a specified period of time, right? You can have the token expired, so it's only within this range of time that that application processor user can access your data. Um, you can specify a range of IP ranges so that they can only be accessed from certain parts of the network. You can specify method of access like HTTPS only. Uh, in the case of a table, you can actually specify a, a certain range of the table that they can access. So again, you can control the access of the user versus granting um, every application, every process, just sort of free run of, uh, of your entire storage. So all of these various permissions um, and delegations are, can be encoded into a SAS token uh, and then issued to a device or user of that data. And then another pattern is encryption at rest. So we offer two forms of encryption. One is our blob storage service encryption. So basically once your data hits our front end, uh, it's then encrypted uh, and, and committed to media in an encrypted fashion. Uh, we'll decrypt it when you read it back. So it's, it's effectively data at rest encryption, right? The data is stored on media in an encrypted form. Uh, we offer Microsoft managed keys today. Um, and in the future, we'll let you uh, have your own customer managed keys. Uh, and then if you don't want it going over the wire, you want to do application level encryption, uh, you can also do that. And we do have client libraries uh, that can enable an implementation of client side encryption uh, as well. So that supports blob and table storage and it also includes support for our key vault based key management. Uh, and then full text search. So, um, you know, the ability to search the objects for supported formats, you can search for text or you can search within the object itself. Um, and you can also search metadata. So a lot of times, maybe you're not actually trying to find, you know, a keyword that's within the actual object, but you've organized the objects in a certain way, and you're actually trying to find an object. Uh, and so again, this is where I mentioned you can search the metadata, or you can search within the blob itself. And you can do that by either standing up your own search service, um, or we do offer first-party Azure search that can, that can enable, uh, enable that. Uh, and there's a link to uh, to a deck and some documentation that contains more information on that. And I did promise I would come back to this, what is hot and cool storage? So we offer tiered storage, right? I think there's a couple different use cases, but if I sort of broadly group it, right, we have what we call the hot use case, um, where you're interacting with that data more regularly, right? It's an active data set, so you're either reading from it frequently or writing to it and you're, you're doing something with it or you're transacting against it more frequently. And sometimes that's also associated with kind of smaller capacity sizes, but not always. 
And then what happens is either that data, data aged out or by nature of that data, um, you can sometimes have particularly large capacity sets where you don't really use it very much, right? So again, I, I'm probably beating this to death, but I really like to call it the right once read maybe, right? Um, email attachments was a great use case, uh, you know, a while back. I'm sure you have, you know, you, you have examples of this sort. It, you have a lot of data. You're very, very seldom looking at it. Um, it it's, it's infrequently accessed, but you have to retain it, right? So we have two different models around that, two tiers, which is the hot tier and the cool tier. And fundamentally, they're the same. So when I talked about all the, all the different attributes of, of Azure Storage, they're largely built on the same thing. It's just sort of two faces and two billing models. With the hot tier, um, there is a higher capacity retention charge, but transactions are much cheaper, right? So it costs a little bit more to store the data, but then if you're frequently interacting with it, that's a lot more cost, um, cost effective. Then we have cool storage, which has significantly lower um, capacity charge, right? So it's, it's deep and cheap, you can store a lot on it, um, and it's under the presumption that you're not transacting against it frequently. So the transaction charges are more, and there are some read-write charges, but again, if you have a large pool of largely inactive data, you're only reading or doing something with a portion of it here and there, the cost of ownership of using cool data is much less. So we offer both of those to give flexibility. Um, the API is 100% is, is identical, so, so implementing on both is, is pretty straightforward, and I'll actually talk a little bit more about that in example. You have the same durability options. Uh, the SLA is different, and that's, uh, that's really more a function of positioning than anything we did functionally to make them uh, have different levels of availability. So for LRS, it's two nines um, for cool, whereas it's three nines um, uh, for the hot. So, <clears throat> so effectively, the idea is it gives you pricing um, to match your workload, right? You, with hot, you have lower access charges so that you can use the data more frequently, and with cool, you have lower capacity charges so that you can retain the data much longer. So the really neat thing about this is you can switch the account tiers uh, as needed, which is if you have a data set that was hot, you bring it in as hot, you do what you need to it, and as you age it out, you can then convert it to cool, and all you do is you tick that box uh, on on the account, which I showed in the demo, and then the data becomes cool, and then it can go off and rest. If you ever need to bring it back to cot, you can do so. There is a, there is a recharge for doing that, so it's not something you're wanna, gonna do frequently. There isn't, there isn't an arbitrage in terms of flipping them back and forth, but if you need to promote it, you can do so. Today, that capability is implemented at the account level. In the future, it will be selectable at the individual object level to give you more granularity and control over being able to manage that. So again, it was something that's intended to give sort of flexibility in how you use your data and optimize the cost model uh, accordingly. Yes, yes it can be. The performance is the same. So it's, it's not cool in that it's, you know, we, we lowered the, the IO or the bandwidth or anything. It's cool because it, it's best used for data that is cool because if you, if you are using it performantly frequently, then it's gonna cost you less to use it on hot, but it, it behaves the same. Yes? So you can pull metrics on that. It is possible to do that. As we go forward, so the first thing was sort of layering in that infrastructural choice so that you can do that. You know, basically flip it and have the tiers. Um, it's our intention over time that, you know, we want to build out, you know, better capabilities to sort of help, help manage that. Um, but today, yeah, you can, you can sort of pull metrics on the capacity uh, to, to help you with that. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. So in the case of um, the hot, um, there's a, so in both cases there's, there is a charge on storage of data, but on the hot it's higher. Um, then you do have transaction cases in both cases, but on hot it's lower, and then you do have a read-write charge on cool that you do not have on hot. Um, I know that's kind of a lot. On our pricing page, we do explain all of the different charges and, and whatnot. Correct, but the, it is different. So you'll, you'll, you'll pay less for storage with cool. You'll pay more for transactions, and again, the assumption is you're not transacting very frequently. For hot, you'll pay more for storage and less for transactions. Yeah, it's pretty much immediate, yeah. Because it's not, it's not moving data, so it's not like we have, um, exposing a little bit under the covers, it's not like we have this, this cool, cheap stuff that we're moving it onto, it's, it's basically an attribute. 
Uh, you don't get charged for switching to cool. What happens is if you bring the data back to hot, it counts as a read charge. So there's a read charge associated with cool and you're basically reading it back into hot. Um, there is no charge to switch it into cool. So, so certainly in most cases where you're going to demote or age out data, it's, it's relatively costless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's a, that's a fair point, and I apologize, we don't have that capability today, but understand, we need to do, we, we, should, we should provide better instrumentation, particularly when you're using through, you know, a third party solution or something and you're not directly controlling the access pattern. Um, so both in terms of having more technical guidance around those use cases and when not to fall in that situation where your TCO for cool is more than hot, um, as well as better tooling, that is our intention to develop that. I don't have anything specific, but we are definitely aware of that. I, I completely agree with you and, and we are working on that. Sorry, was there another question or, okay. Um, and so I'll go through one last uh, case study. There's, there's another partner that we work with, NetApp, who has an AltaVault appliance, which is a purpose-built backup appliance. And again, this uses Azure storage, right? So, um, and this was a case study with the Seminole County Public Schools. It's a, it's a really great school district in Florida, so, uh, so I didn't have another local case study for this one. Um, but fundamentally what they were doing is they were doing old school backup and recovery, right? I mean, they were doing tapes, so you have the old workflow where, you know, it goes into the tape and then the tape goes into the truck and the truck goes into the vault. Um, and if you need to bring it back, you actually had to get it through all of that workflow, right? And so what the Alta Vault is is a purpose-built backup appliance gateway that ingests into local storage on premises and then compresses, dedupe, and tears it off into cloud, right? So it's effectively meant to be um, a, a disk target that, that backs to, you know, a practically unlimited amount of cloud storage. Um, and you can use it as a backup target and then you can also use it for a variety of other cases like, uh, like DR. Um, <clears throat> so they offer both a physical appliance as well as a virtual appliance and then if you mount the virtual appliance within Azure, um, you can, uh, you can rehydrate the data and actually use it within Azure as well. So it can start on-prem, it can be backed up to Azure, and then it can be rehydrated within Azure. So there's a, there's a, data, there's a data backup use case, uh, disaster recovery, um, as well as a data migration angle to that. And so the reason I mentioned this one as well, and it, just on the heels of that, is uh, in most cases, and again, understand there, there may be some cases that we do need to address where that's not the case. In most cases, cool storage is the better target um, you know, for a backup, particularly when, when you know where, you know, with your policy, if you've aged it off, you're not gonna use it very much. Now, originally we didn't have cool storage and the AltaVault was only, you know, streaming to what we had at the time, which was the standard block blob. Um, but the reason I bring this up is as a testament to the API compatibility, when we introduced cool, they actually didn't have to change the code. They just tested it, tried it out, it worked, and they supported cool, right? So it was that seamless. I mean, it, the, the level of API compatibility. Um, so that's something that, uh, to, you know, consider as a, as a proof point in terms of whether uh, you may be using standard object today and you're considering using cool for those use cases. Uh, and then certainly um, from not having to use tape uh, and from the benefit of, you know, so now you can ingest it onto disk, you can do dedupe compression, storage efficiency, only stream out to the cloud um, in a very compressed, space efficient and bandwidth efficient form, uh, the, the customer saw a lot of operational benefits in terms of retiring the legacy tape solution, um, the cost and the pain in managing that, and of course also the SLA in trying to retrieve that right now. Getting it back from the cloud um, is certainly not necessarily uh, as instantaneous as, uh, as on-prem high performance did but it's fairly fast and it's certainly much, much faster than bringing it back from, uh, from tape. So much better experience, much easier access, uh, much better control over restores. Uh, so in a similar vein, we have been working with, uh, you know, partners in this space on developing, uh, you know, backup and disaster recovery. So again, we, we do offer the Azure backup solution, um, which is great for a lot of use cases, but if not, we also have integrated with a lot of the leading vendors um, to do these type of workflows backup. And in some cases, it's a direct connection uh, from, their, from their backup server or from the software uh, straight into the object as an endpoint and as a repository. 
uh, and just a list of some of the some of the partners that we work with. Um, you know, most of the market leaders uh, offer some form of integration with our object storage and use it as a backing store for the backup data set. So uh, that's it in summary. Hopefully, uh, you've come away with a good uh, with a good sort of view of what the object storage is, not just in terms of the nuts and bolts and how it works. Although hopefully that's been clear, but you know what we're about, what we're trying to accomplish, and what our vision is for how that uh, how that works with you both as you know both as developers and IT pros who are trying to implement solutions um, or move various workloads to Azure. Um, you know, again around the hybrid and ecosystem. Yes. Yes. Ah, so what this means is if you have on-premise, right, what you can do is you can back it up into a backup set in Azure, right? So your physical, you know, your physical on-prem estate can be backed up into the cloud. Then you can mount a virtual machine of the, of the software to rehydrate that in Azure and use Azure as a, as a disaster recovery uh, site if you so choose. If, if you're running in Azure, yes, then it would be virtual machines. Yeah. Yes. Questions? Malware detection? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have material on that. That's a separate talk, but um, I, I can get your contact information afterwards and, and give you some information and provide that. Yes. Yeah, so with the, um, so what you would want to do is have your master credentials used as restrictively as possible. That is, the, that's the intent of the SAS token is to, is to basically, you really want to grant the least level of privilege to anyone uh, as possible. I'm not sure if I answered your question on that. There, oh, um. I have to apologize, I'm personally not as familiar with that element of the security, but I can definitely get you that answer. Yeah, I apologize. That one I don't know off the top of my own head. <laughs> yes. 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 That's, auto oh sorry, go ahead. So for that sort of thing, if it's, if it's happening as a part of the storage infrastructure, that's just sort of our automatic operations, right? So we're a clustered hyperscale system. We're constantly you know, migrating, splitting, load balancing. So architecturally, we kind of have our front end. So yeah, if you're, if you're actually explicitly bringing on like Azure IaaS compute resources, that's a different issue. That's a charge, right? But, but sort of that type of operation is implicit in the overall capacity charges, right? So if we do a partition split and now we're serving your account across a greater number of our nodes, that's not something that, that you explicitly get charged for. Yes. Um, we do not have a, uh, an, so we have people, we have uh, partners who have built deduplication solutions um, into Azure, but in terms of like a native or like a client library or an implementation of that uh, on Azure, specifically, no. We, we do have deduplication technology, so like Store Simple, uh, which is a first party product, has one, um, but no, not, I don't think in the way that you're thinking. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Yeah, so there would be work that you would, um, yeah, so, so at least in terms of how, how partners have done it, typically they, they do an implementation of the deduplication. Certainly we can provide technical guidance then in terms of, okay, how much, you know, once you've decided um, from your deduplication scheme what my chunking granularity is, right, you know, what kind of chunk I want to have and whatnot, then how I want to land those in the blob and whether it makes sense, okay, that a chunk should be a blob or whether you want to use um, blocks within a blob to do that type of deduplication. Um, you know, we, we can provide technical guidance or best practices around on how to architect that piece of it. Usually that's what we've done versus, um, at least again to date, architecting an end-to-end deduplication you know, solution that's on our front end or whatnot. 
uh, is something we have not uh, we have not yet done. Um, it does it does cause some other issues in terms of you know as always with deduplication. Then you get into okay, what is the size of your deduplication domain, right? How um, you know how large a scale are you going to maintain the hash table, um, whatnot? And so and so that's one of those things that gets a little tricky, particularly at hyperscale, is is potentially the dedupe domain would either you know grossly limit performance over very very large um, you know things or, or become a choke point, you know whatnot. And and that isn't to deprecate deduplication, but we we haven't you know done something around that as of yet. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have it by resource group. I haven't looked at that metric specific. Yeah, but then not tenants or users of, yes. I'm, I see. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. It's aggregated at the storage level, but you have multiple tenants in the same class of product, right? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take that back. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so. So, so please do. Um, two points of contact um, is one, uh, we have an, an alias here. Uh, I'm one of the recipients of that. But Azure Storage Feedback, so anything that you have questions on that, you can send questions to that any time. Uh, and then for those of you who want, you can stop after I can give you my contact information as well, and you can, you can DM me uh, afterwards if you have any questions. So um, I'll, I'll continue to take questions for a bit. But uh, in the meantime, I see folks are starting to drift out. I know I'm, I'm the last one on a Friday. So uh, I really thank everyone for their time and attention, particularly uh, last time slot of the day. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for your partnership with Microsoft.